Boom. Okay. Uh, we're going to try a little bit of a, a different thing here where we actually recap what we talked about on the episode just to give you uh, a sense for the, I don't know, what we what we talked about. But it was a good episode. We had Travis Rettenmeyer on. He actually had some of the most interesting insights as far as like, okay, ten, one, Major League Pickleball generally, some of the nuances of that final match and and what was happening, why they didn't call timeouts in those pivotal moments. We talked yeah. a lot about the talent wave that's going to be coming from tennis. We talked about his transition. We talked about how to make MLP better, what's so awesome about it. And uh, I thought it was a, a good conversation. It was a great conversation. Can I also talk to you a little bit about um, something I just received in the mail? Yeah, I'd love nothing nothing more. What do you have? Well, first of all, when I opened the mail, yeah, it told me that I provided 10 meals ten. to to fight hunger. So Yeah. That makes you feel all good. All just from opening the mail. And uh in that box was uh these bad boys. Ooh, what do you think? Pretty dope sunglasses. What are they? Shady Rays. Ooh. <clears throat> do you and do you know Shady you Rays? I know of Shady Rays. I don't own a pair. I feel like if you wear sunglasses on a podcast, you look blind. But uh, no, so this brand is the, uh, they're the official sunglasses of the PPA Tour. Did you know that? I didn't. So they're an independent sunglasses company that offers a world-class product that's just as good as any expensive pair we've worn. Okay. Well, can't wait to check them out. Yeah. I want to, I want to know about the donation thing because apparently- well, just Every pair of like sunglasses it. provides 10 meals to fight hunger, and that's pretty awesome. Would you agree? I think so. I think it probably a portion of what you pay to buy the sunglasses goes to meals for the hungry. Yeah, I found it. So they also provide 10 meals to fight hunger in America with every order and have donated over 20 million meals to date. So you can, look good, you can look good in your shades and feel good about the the impact. A couple more things. So if you don't love them, you can exchange them for free within 30 days or you can just send them back. And then uh, also quick, uh, quick offer for our listeners. So they're giving their best deal of the season to our listeners. Mm. You can go to ShadyRays.com and use code DINK, all caps DINK, one word. Of course, it's one word because it is just one word yeah. <laughs> for 50% off two pairs of polarized sunglasses. That's ShadyRays.com, code DINK, all caps, for 50% off two pairs of uh, polarized sunglasses. Two or more pairs, that is. Wow. Yeah. Those do, those do look dope on you, bro. I'd have to say they are your style. So whoever chose them out did a great job. Yeah, they do kind of. They are kind of my style. Yeah, Definitely that's signature them. Thomas Shields right there. <laughs> uh, do you want to hear about uh, Relight? Yeah, talk to me. Number one, uh, electrolyte drink in the game. Hydration should not be a puzzle. This stuff has 10 times more electro electrolytes than leading brands, and you can get it for 15% off on their website using the code PICKLEBALL. Also, all one word. Uh, tastes delicious. And for me personally, it's the only thing that has an effect in the this heat we're in a heat wave here in Arizona. And if I drink Relight, I know that I can go half an hour, an hour longer on the courts. Yes, sir. I like it. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of it. But um, yeah, so now we'll get into the episode. We're going to welcome on Travis Rettenmeyer. And uh, again, this was a really good conversation. So I, I think people are going to like this one. But in the meantime, subscribe on YouTube. Like it. Leave us a comment. Let us know. Follow us on Twitter at Dink Pickleball. Um, and uh, yeah, let's get into it. And we're walking in. Yeah, welcome back to Pickleball. It's kind of been a little bit since New York. It has. It's been a while. But uh, we were going to record. We were in Austin and we were helping with the coverage for MLP on yep. their channels and also on CBS Sports. And uh, we were going to record the podcast out there, but we never got around to it. And it would have been kind of a chore anyways. And, you know, sometimes when you're in the heat of pickleball, you just want to enjoy pickleball for a little bit. No, it was a grind. It was super hot. We were yeah. putting in the work. And when it came down to thinking about recording, uh -huh. I was like walking around trying to find a good spot to do it. And 
I found an okay spot, but ultimately it was like you and me kind of gave each other the look like, nah, let's take <laughs> a break. <laughs> yeah. But uh, Michelle McMahon, our friend, did keep calling this the pickleball pod. I so, thought you were going to correct her eventually, but I, and I was going to correct her on the CBS broadcast, yeah. but I didn't want to like text her while she was up in the booth. You should have. I was like, I was like, whatever. Yeah. That's no, how I, I just was. didn't want to. I, I wonder if you pick, if you but... Google pickleball pod, if ours still comes up or if it's another one that's not ours. Yeah. What the hell? Well, let's change our name to pickleball pod. Now we have to, because <laughs> I don't know. It sounds more official. It's like, all right, like what's the first thing you're going to search for? If you're trying to find a pickleball podcast, you're going to put in like pickleball pod. Like we would be the first thing to pop up. Okay. We can change it to pickleball pod. I don't mind that. Um, anyways, we had a lot of fun out there. It was a grind. It's it's not easy to commentate and and in the heat especially, but it was I enjoyed it. I thought we we did awesome cuz you know how we are. And uh and it was great. And we're going to do more of those. We're going to the other major league pickleball events uh when we can. And uh what else? Oh yeah. Drew Brees was out there. Did you see Drew Brees? You I didn't did. Get to see him. You did. Rip and He's water. shorter than me. Um, yeah. I didn't know he was so such a cute little teeny tiny guy. Is he that small? He's probably like 6'1". Okay, so what does that make me like a little minion? <laughs> yeah, well, I'm just saying. A professional NFL quarterback, I expected him to be like a little bit taller than me. God, um, the height thing's been a, it's been a running joke lately. I've never again, why who else who's been who else I've, been? I've never really been like insecure I'm I'm five I'm like five ten and a half right so uh -huh. I always say five eleven but I'm more like five ten probably but who's harassing you about your height well I kind of made it a joke in like mm -hmm. so I have a new group of friends here in Austin I kind of made it a joke and now it keeps becoming a thing but oh, I think yeah. it's funny so I always play into it so I always send them stuff so I went to go back and find that clip where you're like what do you think DJ Young's wingspan is and I was like oh well probably like six seven or something like that because it it looks like my height right and yeah. i made some jokes so um i kind of keep it alive because i think it's funny okay but uh you know i just want to clarify you know i'm not uh subconscious i'm not one of these daniel craig guys where it's like you see me in person <laughs> you go oh <laughs> oh, oh or you tom know, cruise you know tom what the cruise big, is where they yeah, have yeah, to right, hire so. all the actors in tom cruise's movie have to be under five five so he yeah. looks normal so my my buddies and I do um, trivia once a month, and uh, we go to like a we go in my building. There's a bar upstairs, and it's actually people use it, and uh, they do trivia once a month. And we won the first trivia, right? So we were like the defending champs. So we went back in, nice, and uh, and um, and it came down to one final question, right? Like tie ball game, we could win it on this. And the question is, rank these celebrities in terms of height. And it was, and I'll try not to do it in order, and then you can try it. Okay, yeah. And then we'll move into some more pickleball stuff. Let's hear it. But it was uh, Will Smith, Chris Rock, uh, Kevin Hart, Vin Diesel, Tom Cruise. Okay, I got it. Go. By hot, tallest to shortest? Yeah. Can I do the opposite way? Uh, okay, so we got... Go shortest I think, to tallest. So I think uh, Kevin Hart's the shortest. Then I think Tom Cruise is the next shortest. Then I think Vin Diesel. Then I think Chris Rock. And then I think Will Smith is the tallest. I got it right. Yeah, that might have been it. I'm not sure between no. Vin Diesel and Tom Cruise. No, because yeah, so it was it was the fact that Vin Diesel is 5'11 and Chris Rock is 5'10. And we thought, we thought Vin Diesel being this like action hero, you know, this is, the, that's the trick is everybody thinks he's taller than he is. Yeah. So we were like, okay, let's make him shorter than Chris Rock. But really he's 5'11", Chris Rock's 5'10". Then Tom Cruise is like, you know, 5'7". And then Kevin Hart he's is 5'2". He's 5'2". Yeah. He's teeny tiny. Uh, but you know who's tall? You and Travis Rettenmeyer. Yeah. Who's who's tall? I'm Travis who's not in here yet. Travis is saying something, but he's not in here. Oh, uh, let's should we so I let's guess we'll add him. Yeah. Let's intro Travis Rettenmeyer. 
Uh, we met him at Major League Pickleball. Yeah. Met him for the first time in person there. We yes. wanted to have him on the podcast earlier. I wasn't he here. Had a, he had a good run with Ryler DeHart against um, at some APP and had a, they had a good match against Adam Stone and Deco Bar. And everyone was like, oh, these former tennis players coming into pickleball. Like, you know, it was kind of the, the topic. So we wanted to have him on it then. It didn't happen. Mm-hmm. But he obviously had a hell of a performance as a player slash owner in Major League Pickleball for the Florida Smash. Him and him and J Dub were quite the the men's duo. And um yeah, I think at the when he was walking off the court, I said to him, I think at the vi- like at, at the finals, I was like, here's one takeaway that nobody can dispute. You definitely silence those who are like, you can't be a player and an owner and draft yourself. So uh with well, we've got to talk to him about it. Yeah, let's welcome Get him, him in here. And, and that can be that can be the first thing. What's up, fellas? What's up, What's Travis? Happening? How you doing, dude? Uh, just busy, man. Busy, busy. Back to reality. Are you in a corporate office? Yeah, I'm borrowing my buddy's office. I forgot my computer, so I was like, "Hey, man, can I use a quiet spot?" And you know, yeah. that's the good thing about having a nice network. They they set me up with a spot. Yeah, you sound uh, great. Thank uh, you. Yeah, I have I have nightmares about those ceilings right there. Yeah, I've never done yeah. it. Have no intention of ever doing it. The panels you can push up. Yeah, you, know, you throw up. You throw a pen up there, you get it stuck. No, here's what you do. And here's what we used to do is uh, at the missionary training center where they would train Mormon missionaries before they would go out. They had those same types of ceilings. You could lift up the panels and see into the room next to you. So we would do that at night in our dorm rooms, lift those up and use squirt guns and squirt other sleeping missionaries in the face and then close them back down and they wouldn't know where they got rained on from. Classic, yeah. classic Mormon childhood. <laughs> Dude, you know it, <laughs> Travis. I can't share those uh, experiences. Different, but you know, more camp oriented than the. Yeah, uh, this is the basically the same. Yeah, uh, Travis. I wanted to ask you real quick here a couple of things. Major League Pickleball. You were part owner of Florida Smash. Then you, I assume, had some dis- deciding factor in selecting yourself to be on the team was that a good question i'm curious was that the goal in purchasing or owning having part ownership or ownership of florida smash was to also be able to play 100 percent. yeah i mean uh, i was pretty aware that i wouldn't get chosen if i didn't draft myself you know one not enough people know me they know i'm a tennis guy and i don't blame them i've been playing pickleball that long i still don't Mm -hmm. feel like i'm that good relative to what I can play like. But I also knew if we got to select someone high, like a a one, two, or a three, and it turned out there was a lot of really good dudes there. I mean, Zane, I think got chosen seven, which was disturbing to me. It made no sense. But um, I knew that I would be able to, to link up with a guy that was really good and see how that felt to play with somebody and learn from someone that was better than me. Yeah. And so that was certainly that, and I wanted to have an opportunity to do it. So when we we decided, and I say we because there's a lot of people included in this, friends, they kind of urged me to do it. Um, the intent was to play with someone, and I got as lucky as we could get to play with JW. I mean, the guy is a stud, man, just the coolest kid ever, too. Like, can't, can't say enough good things about him. You know, I could probably talk about him the whole time. So uh, that was certainly the intent, yeah. Okay. Um, I love that so- you own it, You're because yeah, I've – I was wondering if even if you did have, even if you were like part of it was, I just want to draft myself. I was curious whether you'd. No, you got it. You're, it. you're, you're like, yeah, answers I'm to me. I got, I got, I got, nothing, this I got is, a lot, nothing to hide. Yeah. This yeah. is one of those I, things that's where what I would like, do. Yeah. You, this is, I like this. This is like one of those moments where let's say you become something big in pickleball. You achieve something great and people will look back on this and say, even if you, I mean, you guys were finalists, so, may, uh, so maybe you've already done that. For sure, you've silenced people who have accused you of doing that in a negative way. Awesome. But saying like, okay, this was that moment where he took like a risk and became an owner of a team specifically so he could also participate, knowing that he could compete, but also understanding that people didn't know him well enough to know that he could compete. And so you took that opportunity yourself to make sure that it happened, which uh, big respect there. Uh, 
in the finals. I know I don't. Uh, we're talking about something maybe heartbreaking to you. It was. There were two timed outs. I feel like that could have been used. That could have 100%. altered the entire outcome of everything. Why were those not used? The first time that was it the men's doubles where you guys were up twenty to, to sixteen. 12. 12. 20 to 12 at 16. When those guys score 16, why is there not a timeout? The entire audience was calling for you to call for a because, timeout. Because to be honest at 20 to 16, it was more format oriented. No, no. I think we, I think we'd only lost really like, I mean, we lost four points obviously, but I think we'd won three at that point. You know, it, it wasn't like there was a massive dispute. I didn't you were feel winning like, side outs and right. We're getting side outs yeah. and they're, they're scoring points on both sides. So I didn't feel like the, even though the score line was changing and the, the pressure was building, I didn't feel like the momentum had shifted that much. Then at 2017, I want to say, I certainly tightened up, and that's when I should have called it. I know JW doesn't like them that much. I'm certainly not a huge fan of them. I, I understand the benefit. But in the previous match, we were up 20 to 14, and it was almost the exact same scenario where we went to 2019. Uh, I had a good drop, and JW crossed. We won 21-19. So I think that was in the back of my head. They're like, okay, this has happened before. We're still calm. We're still in order. And I think, you know, it, sadly, there was two factors. One, I, I backed off a little bit. I think JW did too. A lot of times he'd been crossing over the middle when we were in dink rallies. If Rafa had floated it up, he'd kind of, you know, do his little jab step across and snap the forehand off. And there was probably three or four balls that maybe that was available, but even more so where it was on my side and I should have reached and uh, and just closed it. But I was rather confident that I would beat Rafa more often than not in a dink rally. And we charted it after it was seven to three, even though we lost the last several. So tactically it was okay. It was a decent idea, but, but I don't like the way that I just let opportunities slip and kind of hope that JW would do it for me. Now, with that said, the, the cool thing about JW, the, the thing that I love about the guy is I don't think he's ever cared about something as much as he cared in this particular instance. Like I'd never seen, I've watched JW a lot just as a fan and thought, you know, what the hell's wrong with this guy? Like, come on, man, give me a little emotion. Give me a little juice. And on day one, very little. By day three, the guy's like eyeballing me like, let's go. Yeah. And, you know, it was like, like they, that was my favorite part. So I think what the reason I say that, I think he wanted it so much for the people around him, the people that were kind of bringing him out of his shell, that he, he froze a little bit too. He wouldn't probably say that. But I think that's what I saw. And I know that feeling when you care so much and you want to do so well for the others around you, that it can prohibit you from maybe – playing as freely as you should. Right. No, I think even from my perspective there, I, I could feel that or sense that or see that happening a little bit. And that was both of us. He and you were both both more like, don't make a mistake here. Right. Rather than let's win. Right. And the format does that a little bit, right? Because even though we're up 20 to 12, I think we essentially had four match points, actual match points. And on one of them, uh, we had a great dig out, great point. And I played, which I referenced earlier, I played like a, a shot in my rec games that's perfect. I had a little drop and I wanted to nut it over to the right side so that everyone shifted and Zane earned it and, and busted a ball up the middle. Like that's something I have to learn. In that particular situation, you never go line, you go middle. You just take that yeah. out of the equation. But I've never played someone that's done that. It's just yeah. never happened. So yeah, um, yeah there, there's definitely a learning curve there. And, uh, and we, we had opportunities to close it. The format certainly made us feel a little more tense and I think that it needs to be adjusted slightly, but, um, but certainly it, it created great drama and great matches. Talk, so wait, then, talk, talk about, I want you to just expand on that really quickly. What do you think about the format could, could change? I think the format's awesome. I mean, there's no doubt, like just being a part of it, the drama of the matches was insane. Uh, you never feel out of it as obviously they didn't. And I went back and I think the, the Ernie that, Zane hit was at 2013. So they're essentially down 20 to 14. Now it's, it's not really close. We've been killing them, but he knows as well as, you know, everybody else that they got a lot of shots now that maybe we're only going to get one or two more chances. In my opinion, the team that's winning is at a disadvantage because when the team that's behind gets to 20, they still maintain serve, right? So now at 2020, they have the first look to go to 21. Shouldn't be that way. It should be something along the lines, like if you are up 2017, let's say, or more, and you've dominated the match, then they need to alter that. Where like maybe at 2020, um, if you're behind that much, like I said, the, the team that was leading gets the serve so that they get the first opportunity. Or even, even more so, like, okay, you made this comeback, but now the team that was 
up by three or five or whatever you want to make the number. Now they have the opportunity to score on both sides, yeah. serve and return, and you have to win two in a row on your serve. So that way, there's just not like a massive disparity. Because again, we, we charted it after, and I think it was five points more that we won, and we lose. So that, that you know. Interesting. La the last part that's important about that, though, and this is the most important part, it's monetization. Gambling is everything for sports, right? Nobody wants, I shouldn't say nobody, but a lot of people watch sports because they like to gamble on. They care about that. They want to put some money down. And I know when I put money down on sports, I, the spread is the only thing I bet. I bet the spread. How do you bet a sport that the spread is two every time, right? It's because you can't, the, all, almost every match that we played, I would say 75 to 80%, it ended up being a two-point spread. So it alters that too much where it's too predictable, again, creates great theater. And I think Steve is aware of that. He's, he knows that it's, it's, there's something slightly wrong. But he also knows that he's got an incredible product that nobody can, can compare to yeah. and that creates amazing drama. Travis. But if you're going to get into the gambling aspect, which is critical, then you have to make a slight adjustment so that somebody can come on and say, okay, JW and Zane are going to win by five points tonight. And that's what it is. You can't just have it be two, 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 two. Here's what we Travis. do. So you need to stop making all my points before I get to them. Okay. No, this is it. Sorry, dude. When you get I, I to 20, when you get to 20 and it's your side out, then you get a one and a two serve. Would that, That's good. Would that work? That you would go work. to full pickleball standard but at what point, rules. So, so 20, 20 as in like, like no. Zane and then he gets this, or the guys that were ahead get the one, two serve. No, so as you are at 20, 12, every time you get a side out, you get a one and a two serve. Okay. So you can't, you don't go to rally scoring, but you get two opportunities every time. I got you. I got you. That's better because I would free it up a little bit. Yeah. And I would free it up a little bit. It would be something to experiment with. And then if that's not working, then you could take greater measures into your hands and say, whoever gets to 21st at 2020, they get side out as Wait, well. Wait, so you're saying the team that's behind has two, two serves or no, everybody? no, only the team ahead gets two serves. So if, so where Travis and J Dub were at twenty twelve, no, that because then that creates even more insulation for the winners. I mean, basically, you're no, you're it's taking not creating the more insulation the for team... the winners because you're still not only allowed to score on serve, right? But the other guys can still score on my serve, so yes. they get two serves, we get two serves, but then it's no, you get forth. they you, only you get two serves, only but if you get two serves until they get to twenty. But if you know you have two serves and it's for all the marbles and you have a, the backstop of a, a second serve, why wouldn't Zane or some of these players do the craziest serve? I know that's what you, that's what they earned. And, they earned that right because they're ahead by six points. But in the, your, your, this is circumstantial. And they're you, taking a big, they're taking a they're big not risk always going to be. Serve. No, I, I disagree. I think I disagree with this. I mean, I, I don't, I don't know what's like to be honest. I don't Let's know. Let's try it. We gotta try it. Yeah, we gotta try it. We gotta try some stuff out, and we're gonna There's, try things. There's no doubt. There, there are two things that you touched on, though. So I actually talked to Steve about this afterward, and uh, he said specifically, the format is the reason you you used a great word, theater, is the reason that match got so exciting at the end no because question. they they could make that crazy comeback, and so Steve is a massive fan of that. And if that's the mentality over there at MLP, I would doubt that they even think about making a change to that specifically because no, he will. He, he, we, we've already he discussed mentioned he that he loves that. But I he do will, agree. Right? But I agree. Gambling, yeah, it needs to happen in pickleball if we want the pro game to do what we all want it to do. I sure. think some people are against it. Gambling will bring in so much more interest and outside viewers, even if it's just in some cases degenerates who want to gamble doesn't matter it gets more people talking more eyeballs that's what the sport needs so gambling should be a big factor but i i think we've got a little ways to go for 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 that to happen i don't think it's that far off to be honest well i know for a fact that it kind of got stopped in its tracks and really they need to basically like reignite those conversations gotcha. and um i'm i'm i think i'm not i don't gamble on sports i you know i use super bowl sometimes but yeah. like 
you know what I've been gambling on? On the NBA finals, I've been gambling on who makes the first basket, but I only will put money on anybody who's paying out greater than 10 to 1 because of all the starters. If you're getting a larger return than 10 to 1, why, how could you not? I'm ahead, dude. I've been doing it like the whole <laughs> NBA, uh, the whole NBA playoffs that I'm ahead. So I, I gam- I, put, I used to say I was ahead. I'm not everybody ahead. does that. Rush. That's everybody's yeah. got a system until the system just, fails. Exactly. The and system then fails. they have a sad, sad tale. Right. Travis, we talked about that timeout initially with you and J dub. Now we move to mixed doubles. Yeah. Identical scenario. No timeout. I know. Just, just poor, just poor, poor management on my, on my part in particular, you know, they, they classified me as the captain. I kind of went with, J Dub's feeling like again he's he's not a big time out guy he just plays and I yeah. love that I love that about him. However, okay, um, what I did recognize as time progressed and I, and I, it's more like a personality thing. But when I went really introspective after it was all done, mm-hmm. I was very submissive towards J Dub in the beginning because the guy's better than me. He's just a better player. He's played yeah. a lot longer, and um, so there was like this initial theory like, hey, you just be the male version of Lee make balls, let J-Dub do his thing. But J-Dub had an extreme respect for me based on tennis. He was a tennis kid growing up, so he knows my accolades there, and, and he was asking a million questions regarding these things. I guess where I'm going with that is I noticed as time went on, he was looking to me more to make decisions. He didn't want to make them. He wanted me to say, for instance, when we were up, we're up 2012, like I should have asked him, hey, man, are you a little tight? You a little tight? Like, I got it. Don't worry. I got you. And same scenario there. I should have said, it doesn't matter if he feels comfortable with the timeout. This is the right thing, uh, you know, from a, a, an, old, an older guy who maybe sees that this is shifting and the momentum is altering. I should have made those moves and and next time I will, you know, and then that's all I can say really about it. It was a learning curve for me. I, I feel like I learned a lot in that process and there's no doubt that that won't happen again. Okay. Uh I, I mean, I agree. Like you have the experience, you have like the wisdom and stuff like that. You should step in there and you recognize that there is a rule in major league pickleball where in between stops teams can trade out a player, but you're in a unique position that you're an owner. You're not trading yourself. No. Okay. No, thanks. I know. <laughs> I talked to block, Steve about I, this. I, I was like, what... Travis is protecting. There's, he can't. He's an owner. He's not. He, 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 there's no way that that would happen, anyways. Uh, but hypothetically, hold on. Can you? Can you? But it has to be. If you do trade a player, it has to be one of the reserves that no. MLB yeah, chooses. It has to be someone that submitted an application. You can name a new player. One new player between each stop that was an applicant. I didn't and know that. The reserves That's stay the same. Yeah, I wonder so, if some of the teams are entertaining that, or if there's just too much. So allegiance. interesting. Was there's, there somebody that failed so bad? There's no question. I mean, I've heard rumblings already. So okay. who and really? where and what? I can't tell you, but but I'm sure you're going to see a little shifting. And then a uh, hmm. last thing about the team aspect of Major League Pickleball, and we we harped on it a lot that weekend, and even building up to it. There's so much money at stake here for some of these younger players are you getting together with jw are you getting together with lee are you getting together with maggie to train more to like get that energy and synergy and everything flowing so that at the next one you're even better than you were at the last one yeah i think um just logistically it's going to be tough to get everyone together unless we're all at a particular stop and we go a day early what I'm going to suggest to them is that we go two days early to California just to get some some reps in. But J Dub and I have already talked a lot about you know meeting in the middle of Florida, me going to the east, him coming to the west, and um, you know which is great for me. The more that I can get time with him, the better. But yeah, there's there's no question. Seeing the the outcome, like it exceeded all my expectations. There, there's no doubt we're going to do whatever we can to be as ready as possible for the next event. <clears throat> Okay. I like it. And Thomas, you might not know this about Travis. You don't drill. Is that correct? From our sh- short conversation on Instagram, mostly for training, all you do is play rec games with 4.0 level players. <laughs> That's about right. Yeah. Yeah. Like the night after uh, the day we lost Major League Pickleball, I was at my local Crescent Lake the following evening, you know, playing my, my standard games, which I love those folks. You know, I mean, they're, they're the reason I'm playing pickleball. But I got one buddy that I drill with who's solid enough to drill with, and he's 
he's uh, got soft hands and, you know, we can go through all our reps and he does that regularly. But I would say 85% of my play is exactly what you just stated. Wow. Okay. So on that note, we're always looking for a third host. Sounds like you <laughs> might you might fit in with with our style here because you are. I mean, a you're a testament to you know, got you got to drill. Don't you have go to, to the drill. NFL, you can go to the major league pickleball finals and you don't have to drill. Yeah, what's the fun in drilling? Is what we've always it's asked not, ourselves. It's not that fun. It's, I find it boring as can be. Yeah, and I've and I've read a lot of this like john's and parento drill 80 percent of the time like to me that's yeah. totally ludicrous J, J dub's not doing that i talked to him about that. he's not doing that he wants to play and that's why he's so creative and he's so good tennis we have a very simple structure you train half the time drilling and half the time you play points now i think that makes a lot more sense problem is you need good competitors to make that you know realistic right um so yeah no no i will never be a, a big time driller i fall in love with a shot pretty consistently but I'm going to rep that shot and the 4.0 dudes, 4.5 dudes that I play with, they don't care what I try. They just want me to play. Yeah. So if you guys aren't going to be able to, if you're only going to go out two days early and, and train together, are you worried that some of these other teams meanwhile are going to be like together for the next couple months, just like drilling as a team nonstop. I mean, they've got well, 25 grand on the line. Like, you know, they, they sort of see it. They're like, okay, we have an opportunity to make a run. Let's make this our, our career until, until uh, the next stop. Yeah. And I think, I think that's possible. You know, people might do that. It's an unrealistic expectation for me at the moment, just given my life, which I intend to alter because I want it to be more about pickleball. But if they make that commitment and they're willing to do that, then all the power to them. I hope they do. But um, I don't, it doesn't really concern me because I think in a few days, one, we learned a lot about each other, and I think JW and Lee will certainly play consistently over the next few months, as they always do. They'll certainly get enough reps. They certainly know each other well enough. I think the issue is me playing with Maggie, and um, that was certainly our weakest point. And then I have no issues that JW and I, because we live relatively close, we'll be able to get in enough practice time that that we are are solidified and, and solid as a team. And I mean, we've been talking every day since just communicating on what he thought, what I thought. And, and we have a very similar view on what took place. So um, I think we'll sure up any issues that we have. So no, the other teams really don't concern me. I hope they bring it. I hope they get as, as good as they possibly can. Yeah. What's um, there's a lot of different ways we could, and we, we can come back to some of the stuff too, but I want to ask you coming from and for the for the listeners who who may not know Travis former pro tennis player you got ranked top 100 top 60 in in doubles in dubs yeah I'm I'm not sure what your your singles record was not but great. around 250 coming into so making the transition into pickleball and now that you've played at you know debatably the the highest level what are some of the the things that surprised you or you didn't expect that were adjustments that you had to make or Anything that jumps out to you, really? I mean, there's certainly a lot of nuances that I was that I didn't respect early on. Um, you know, subtleties, certain shots, things that that I'm watching better players do that I'm like, okay, I need to add that to my game. And, and I think one of them was really clear in the end uh, is, and since I've worked on it, because there's probably, like I said, there was probably four balls where I could have reached, and I yeah. noticed I stand in a pretty what I would classify as a tennis stance. I'm almost upright, like I'm low, but I'm not exactly thinking reach with my arms. My, my hands are in. So some of my dinks were pretty effective. They were cross court rollers with a fair bit of bite on them. And I didn't anticipate like the next ball I'm reaching. And so that was one from a tactical perspective that like you don't do, because if you hit a good ball to a good spot in tennis, you just close the net, you're on top of the net. You don't have to reach. Um, on the negative side, the one thing that's really surprised me is the lack of professionalism. You know, the, the, the players that play aren't professional. They're just not professional. I'm not accustomed to that. And nothing in terms of what? How, how, how so? Practice time, preparation. Um, I just, I don't see them. And, and in some ways it's good in the fact that it keeps pickleball in some regards lighthearted. And, and I like the atmosphere and I think all the players are very good. But when you come from the world that I came from, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of money at stake. People have usually been playing since they're three, four years old. And the idea of dedicating five hours intensely a day 
to your craft is very normal. That's just the way you do it. You don't, you don't go out and get hammered. You don't, you know, lose and, and, you know, you just don't, you, you keep it going. And so I think, you know, JW is probably one of the few, I'm sure Ben might be that way. And obviously Tyson's that way. I think there's some guys that are super professional and yeah. take this the right way. And I think the vast majority are kind of like an eh, hour to a practice, you know, I'm good. And that's it. Yeah. And I think, I think that, you know, JW, for instance, he goes trainer five days a week. He's doing a lot of uh, dynamic exercises. And I think you can see it in the way that he moves and the way that his body is altering as he, as he ages. So that's one thing that I hope changes uh, as the sport evolves, as you see some real professionals. Now that's going to require more money to get into it because not, nobody's going to pay a trainer five days a week if they're making $20,000 a year. But once right. that changes, then I think you will see uh, guys who put the blinders on a bit more and, and, and do, do, do it that way. I think like, also to that, um, even from uh, the fans' perspective, is that uh, lack is kind of a harsh word for it, but of professionalism. And sitting in the stands at Major League Pickleball, I noticed a lot of times when teams are playing, those team members on the sidelines are not in their chair at the sideline supporting their team the whole time. Sometimes they were going up in the stands and hanging out with their other professionals or their significant others for a little bit, crossing over a little bit to t talk a little bit. Oh. I, I was a college swimmer and I did that one time to right. somebody I went to high school with that was at the university we were competing at. I went and said hi to them in the stands, came back down. I got reamed and punished for leaving the sidelines during a swim meet. And even from a camera's perspective, you go to the sidelines and there's one of the two teammates sitting there and the other one's gone. Right. Like, well, there's two schools of thought for that. I think Tyson, uh, like for me, I was so into it that I was getting like nervous during some of the matches. And I was concerned that I was so wired that the next match, maybe I would not be performing as well because my nerves were already a little shot. So I was like, all right, okay. the Dave, Davis cup, for instance, you'll see a, a lot of the guys they'll leave like an hour before, like they don't even know what the score was. They don't care. It's just like, okay. I win my match. That's how I help my team. Now, I don't think that's the case here. I don't think guys are that, again, that professional where they're thinking, uh, I think they're more just being social. Now, I'm all for social. I love social. I want banter. I want the whole thing. But yeah, if that's the case, then uh, I can't relate because I was out of my chair the whole time. I wanted to I would give as much juice as I could. Yeah. And it's fine to be out of your chair, but I think you, from my perspective, and even from, I think, a camera, like seeing it on TV, those teammates need to be there supporting their team the entire yeah, time. Yeah, I'm in, I'm in jumping less, out of my chair. Yeah, no totally question. fine. They should, That's they totally fine. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. should be there cheering, supporting, watching in anticipation. But like, I get it. Like maybe there are certain nerves and they do better to clear their head out of the way. But even still, maybe you can figure a way to do that while being on the sideline in yeah. front of your team. Yeah, you don't see it in the NBA, right? Guys are sitting there. They, got they have sit there. to be there. Right. Yeah, they would be fi probably fined for getting out of their chair and going somewhere else. Right. So, uh, yeah, but I mean, that's also the charm of pickleball, right? Is that it's casual and it's fun and that it's, you know, uh, wear your cargo shorts to work day. Uh, so, <laughs> so <laughs> like it's, it's a little bit though. <laughs> What? Got to switch it a little bit. I mean, I'm, yeah. I like, again, I love the pickleball vibe, but I think it's yeah. switched a little bit. Yeah. And when we talked to you a little bit, you said that your nickname is, there's a couple things. The dirt bag. The dirt bag is legit. How did that come to pass? Sadly. I mean, I'm grungy. Always have <laughs> okay. been. You know, I'm good with that. Would like to alter it, but like, unless I have a girlfriend at the time, I dress badly. Say it again. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I wasn't I sure if it was like your like an appearance thing, grungy, or like you're willing to uh, you know maybe call a questionable line here and there. Oh, something. definitely not. That is the one thing I'll never condone. It's it's it'll it's actually a, a red card for me right away if you cheat. We're done. Yeah. But um, yeah, no, no dice on that one, bud. Uh, but you know the other one is like I'm kind of when I came into pickleball, it was super casual for me. It still is to some extent. You know, but um, I, the guys make fun of me where I play because I show up with like one paddle, mat mismatching socks, wearing jorts, whatever you want. And then I'm like, hey, anyone got a grip? Anyone got some water? Like, I need these things. So it kind of just came to be like the dirt bag doesn't show up with anything. You know, it just takes everybody's stuff. And I've become close enough with these people that I kind of just walk by their bags and I take, I take, I take, I take. And it's just kind of like a known theme now. It's more of a joke than anything. 
I got a full bag of freebies. My backpack is filled with grips and yeah, don't uh, let me walk by, hydration bro. and everything. No, it's, I mean, by. it's free for the taking. It's communal. Um, That's what I say. It's communal. Yeah, it is. And then yes. the other thing that we talked about a little bit was you said you have more non-playing paddle tricks than anyone in the game. Yes. How, how come you're not showboating these on your Instagram? I mean, I, I only shown one, like the, the, the twist, you know, but there, there's a couple others that I'm working on. There's one guy, I don't know if you've seen him, his name's um, Stefan Bjork, I believe his last name, but a tennis dude. And he's okay. got all these nasty, so I'm trying to transfer into pickle. It's harder because the paddle is a little smaller, but the one that I get the most props for is the spin. Nobody can, I only know one other dude that can do that. And, um, and everyone that always sees it's like, you know, gives me a little grief. I always thought like DJ Young would be the right guy for it. I was like, man, you're not chill enough. You can't do this. He's like, I'm so chill. I don't even try it. He was like, yeah, touche. <laughs> well said. Um, so yeah, yeah, I got a few of them. Okay. Well, we'll stay tuned for that. So the, the singles as a player and owner, right? You have stake in the league in more ways than, than one and a unique perspective. The dream breaker. It is, um, touted as this amazing thing that brings in the fans. It's super exciting, uh, can decide the the fate of potentially the championship if it comes down to it. But at the same time, it's very odd to me, particularly for what we want to say is like the premier professional level of, of pickleball. Do you think that the dream breaker really has a place moving forward? if we want to put this, well, I'd be curious of your perspective, like watching it, what did it look like to you? It's certainly odd, you know, that the it's, way that it's it matches fun. Up. Yeah. It's fun to watch, but it just, it seem it makes it seem more like a game than like, you know, and that sort of lends to these players aren't professional, right? It's not, they don't look at it as their craft yet. They don't take it super seriously. Right, in the, in my mind, fun. the dream breaker, it's like, Oh, so a basketball game goes to like a, uh, a three point shootout. If it's tied, like you would never, you would never want something like that. It's fun. It's exciting. I love watching it. It makes for, for like, um, you know, good, good highlights and stuff. But, like that, but. but soccer does go to a shootout eventually yeah. sometimes. That's uh, true, yeah. I mean, and maybe you could structure it a little Hockey. like the fans, the fans loved it. Like there I was so much you. enthusiasm for it, but maybe there's a way to structure it a little bit more professionally where beforehand you have to name your one, two, three, and four in the order of talent or something so that you have the ones matching up against the ones. And then you That's get like thinking. a true battle, right? You get one through four. Uh, yeah. you know, we had one, for instance, where I matched up with one particular girl and it decided the match. And I mean, obviously in the, in the one JW played against Simone, I have no idea. We, initially we had this idea. It wasn't my idea, but one of our players thought that it would be best to like sacrifice certain players and you play it in this. It didn't make any sense to me. I was like, no, I, JW can go 8-0 against anyone. He needs to yeah. play first every time. I'll play second. Lee or Maggie, you guys go third and fourth. Like it's just statistically, it just makes sense. You have your best player play as many points as possible. Right. But I think that's the way to do it. If you want to maintain the dream breaker and maintain that drama, then you have your one, two, three, four lineup. You don't, you don't put Simone yeah. against JW. Yeah, but and it's just said, based like, I, on it's based on the duper rating alone. So you don't get sure. to determine like right. what skill level people are at, and that way, yeah, then you have your ones playing your ones. I, I see the side though that you know if a a girl plays great and wins a few points off a guy like Vivian played JW the one day. I think they went four and four. You know, like yeah. like damn, and yeah. and that's exciting. That's cool to root for, but it's a little gimmicky. I think so, but. Um, but I don't know what the better alternative is. And and I say gimmicky, but it's really not up to me in that regard. It's up to the fans. And if they found it compelling and they were, you know, rah, rah, rah and all about it, then that's really all that matters. Right. Yeah. I, yeah. I, and I think that too, like the fans, definitely the dream breaker was the highlight for the fans. Like I mean, the crowd was louder, play, the clown crowds were stomping, they were cheering, they were, and like you said, like, uh, I watched those, uh, who was it uh, that went four and four that you mentioned? Vivian. 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 She did that like multiple times with multiple guys. Dude, and shredder. she doesn't even play singles that often. Right. And that's kind of like what Lee Whitwell did last year where she kept sneaking shots past like uh, Jay DeVillier. And uh, so it was, that that part is exciting, but 
And I don't know if there's a better way, like if the fans love it and, you know, even with gambling, like there is a risk and a chance to gambling. And if you take that out, then there's no like real incentive to like, you know, keep your fingers crossed and hope this and that. And there's some luck aspect to the game as well. So I think that has to exist. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. T- tough one to say. I mean, unless there's a better alternative I, for now, I like it, but maybe again, maybe I would be very surprised if the scoring system, the format and some things weren't adjusted within the next 12 to 24 months. And what's next for you? Uh, dad for now, dad and yeah. job, <laughs> dad and job, dad and job, uh, boring as hell. When's your next tournament? When I'm playing like, your city, playing okay. with uh, Gabriel Tardio. Uh, nice. yeah, yep, stoked about playing with him. Think he's really good. Uh, actually, don't think he gets as much credit as he should. As I've watched him, I think he's nasty. And then, uh, he's, I was fortunate, he's more hype. yeah, he's getting a little more hype. And, and then, uh, yeah. this kind of you know, my friend would, would always joke because, like. The tournaments that I was leading up to prior, I was always teaching up to the day that it came. Like even when I played the U.S. Open, I played singles. I taught 30 hours that week, six hours the day before, like baking in Florida sun and woke up to play Rafa Hewitt. And I was literally cramping in the first game. I was like, this is ridiculous. So I wanted to play, but I couldn't prepare appropriately. So I played Rafa and then played Ben. And long story short, I just told myself, like, I'll never play a tournament again unless I prepare appropriately in some context. It's just I'm not going to misrepresent myself. So uh, for this tournament, for MLP, I was fortunate that the the job that I have was kind of on on a leave for about two weeks. So I was able to do basically nothing but play pickleball, which is, I think, why I was a little bit sharper. And and Beer City will be the same. You know, I'll make sure that I I prepare appropriately. And and anyway, this event led a lot of players to reach out to me. I reached out to some, and my buddy kept calling it my quinceañera at uh, MLP. He's like, this is your coming out, man. No excuses. Like, if you lose here, it's, you know, that's toast. But fortunately, guys like Diescu and, and, and Lang have showed an interest in potentially playing some ball together, which is what I hoped for. So in terms of other ten- – like you, your, you talked about your network earlier. I'm sure, to, I'm sure it's filled with like former, former tennis pros, right, people on the tennis side. Yep. Is there more talk of some of these guys maybe in the – who are outside of like the top, you know – where you can make money in tennis saying, Hey, maybe, maybe it's time to really make a run at this, this pickleball thing. thing. Or do you have have buddies that are talking about, like they're just being more interest generally. I think the guys who are my age generally aren't making that push. I don't know if they have the same fixation on pickleball that I do. It kind of came to me by chance. Um, But there's no doubt that there's going to be a, an, a massive sweep of talent in the next three to five years. Like it's going to be insane because tennis is extremely elitist. If you are not in the top hundred in the world in singles, you're not making money and top hundred in the world in singles. You are a bad man. Like you are a damn good player. You are an athletic beast. There's just no alternative. So as guys around that 200 range, 200 to 500 range. And there was an interview years ago where McGovern said, anybody top thousand, like once top thousand gets into it, it's game over. He's not wrong. Like the, the skill set's just higher. Now there's, there's going to be anomalies in that guys who grew up playing alternative sports, whether it's ping pong or badminton or something who have great hand eye and, and are different. But I think you can't really compete with a kid who's had a racket in his hand since he was three and is physically as gifted as they are, whether it be naturally or through training over the time. So, you know, that's where I always like this PPA debate, right? The PPA, PP, they're buying these players and exclusive contracts. It's like, go ahead, man, buy them, buy all, yeah. them. Fuck, take them all. Yeah. But in, you can't buy every guy that's about to wake up and go, you know, screw tennis. I want to play pickleball. You're not going to buy all 50 of those that are coming in the next three to five. Right. And that, that talent pool is going to be so large that, with all due respect, do you think the guys that are t- the top now are the top then? You're, you're mad. You're mad, dude. There's it's, there's no chance. Yeah. This is my prediction yeah. since the three-year contracts came out. Is that, yes, Thomas, no, you don't say. I said that these kids that are learning pickleball, the talent pool is going to be so much greater, and the people at the top are not even going to be near the top because instead of people discovering pickleball, at 30 and coming into the sport and deciding it's what they want to do. Now you have kids that are playing at like 12, 13 years old coming up through the ranks and they're going to be there 
I didn't necessarily put it all in those terms, but that is an idea I have said more yeah, than you, one time. Yeah, the talent, the talent tool is going to be huge. Sorry, go ahead. No, but I think like we, we've guys, certainly talked about that, but I just want to call out the fact that when the contracts came out, I, you and yeah, I were sure. on different sides of that, and you thought it was the end of the world, and I was like, I think it's going to be okay. I think it's still going to be the end of the world. I think that still the PPA is going to be like, well, we can't afford all this young talent that we're seeing in 2023 because we've got all these guys locked up. And now all of a sudden this talent's able to go elsewhere or do something else. And we don't have exclusivity to the top guys in the world. Yeah. Well, I still, I still maintain my stance. Hell, man. I mean, but I think they can afford it. It's just a matter of whether they're willing to buy it and they see it as a good business model. It's just a terrible business model, in my opinion. But then you're buying it every single year for That's a my point. contract? You're buying it every single year. You're trying to maintain the, uh, the, the creme de la creme, and nobody knows where the creme de la creme is coming from right now. Nobody well, knows. You're all, I mean, also think about if they're going to go try and re-sign people or sign new players, they're also saying, but you can't go keep, compete for this, you know, Right. seventy five grand in exactly. Three years, I mean, imagine, which imagine is easily if you're the that. highest payout in the sport. By far, how pissed are you if you signed a contract where you so get a mad. grand to show up at, a, at an event fifteen times a year, or whatever? Like, who cares, man? Good yeah. thanks. And in yeah. one fair swoop, Steve Kuhn and the rest of the owners are like, "That was a mistake. Don't do that again." Like, we're 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 putting coin into this, and we're going to make it better. And just being in the, these owners' meetings with these people who are very legit folks man they they aren't playing around like they're not they're not playing this is going to be enormous one way or another yeah. and they've got deep pockets and they've got large dreams and they're aligned in their thought process it's not fragmented as everyone thinks it's becoming more aligned in the focus and as soon as that happens it's it who knows where this goes yeah i well, gave this idea to zane uh travis and he didn't take it so i'm gonna give it joke to you. coming joke coming i, I know you're tee up I'm going to give it to you. All right, do it up, buddy. Just start claiming that you're the best pickleball player in the world, and the PPA players are scared to come to one of your events and play you, and they're purposely avoiding your events. And you're there. You're there anytime. If they want to come and battle, you're yeah. there. And just keep doing that. Why can't you? And then maybe like that actually becomes reality, or people believe it. Re it's reality. And like, that's, I mean, I mean, isn't that, that really kind angle. of J dub at the moment? Like he plays a few PPAs, but isn't that him? I mean, yeah. would, would we really like, he lost to Ben in the final, but he was beating the pants off of him. And then again, I think he froze a little bit. He's young, but are you betting against JW in any match in singles right now? Cause I'm not, not like that guy that, as dirty as it gets. Yeah. Not unless the odds are really like a huge. <laughs> 10 to one. Yeah. Like 10, 10 to, to one. one. No, even yeah. like two to one, I think is, uh, is a way better, you know, no, Zane, Zane's gotten a couple wins over him recently. Yeah. That's well said. And Zane's playing nasty, but there's another example, right? Like a guy who is probably not getting all the cred that he deserves. And I think it's just cause he's so polished, but dude, that, that guy's as dirty as it gets also. Now if I find JW more fun to watch just cause his hand speed is so ridiculous, but yeah, Zane's gotten a few times. Uh, he and Ben have been back and forth pretty close. But to me, I still wager that he that JW is the best player in the world and improving yes. faster than everyone else. Well, I, I don't know. I think it I think it goes back and forth because Zane's taken J Dub out a, a, in a couple of recent tournaments, right? Yeah. So so pretty recently, he's never been able I, to touch Ben. I think you have to look at those, right? Because to me, it's a, and I and I watch this from a, a different perspective, I suppose. But to me, it is how he's losing that's interesting. If you watch the last one where they play in New York, he's down, I think, like six one or something like that, and he ends up he ends up being at some point like up a game and up like six one or six zero in the next game to close it out. JW does, and again, he's just having a little bit of a difficulty at the moment with that close. But when I watch the level of play when he's at his peak. There's no one that touches that level, right? So for me, that's what I'm looking for more than the outcome at the moment. What mm -hmm. I'm looking for is that level of play. Now, there's definitely something mentally there that's a little block that he's going to have to get through. But I don't know. What are what are Zane's results with Ben? You said he never touches Ben. Ben always beats him. Yeah. Did he ever get him? No. No, he's taking games off of him, but he's but never, never won one. Correct. Okay. As soon and as Ben think, turns it on, it's like. And who do you think? Do you think that's how, what was the last time they played? Are you familiar? Probably over, I would say five, 
three months, five, three months. four months, okay, so five, five months. Five months, Punta Gorda, JW beat Zane like 11-2, 11-1 or something in the final. I thought it was the most insane performance that I'd seen. And since then, Zane's improved immensely. Again, and even last year, if you look at it, when the MLP happened, nobody chose Zane because he was a bad doubles player. Zane's a great doubles player, right? Like the guy's altered. He's shifted who he is as a player also in that span. So, yeah, Ben, this, Ben, that, like whatever. And I'm, I'm not all for it, man. I'm pro Zane, pro J Dub. Yeah, I can tell. Yeah. Uh, I still think Ben is, is, um, he's still, he's still, he's still the, the guy. guy for you. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I think he, I think he will be for at least like two more years. I think Ooh, it'll be, that's, I'll take that bet all day. I think it'll be. <laughs> okay. Oh, you're gonna, we're gonna go offline soon and figure out the wager here. He's not a gambler. He already, he already said he's not a gambler. Yeah, Thomas right. isn't a gambler. He'll gamble. <laughs> no, can't afford it right now. Oh, you <laughs> wasted more money on dumber stuff. Come on, Thomas. That's true. The so highs. two years in let's this say twelve months, we wager that JW is the best player in the world, and Ben is number two. And if they play, starting really? at this point. If JW has a winning match. record against him, then I win. And if Ben has a winning record, then you win. And we'll just make it like 10 bucks just for fun. All right. All right, All right. So, in we'll of 20, so in June of 2023, so in June of 2023, JW needs to have more wins over Ben than Ben has over J Dub. Correct. And a higher rating. And a higher rating, yes. Okay. Which I think he will because he's playing more tournaments. So but mostly okay. it's it, mostly we should just make it the head to head. I think the head to head is more important. That yeah. is actually more important. Yeah. There's only so many instances where that's going to happen too. So it'll be, it'll be interesting. And I, to be honest, looking forward, I'm not even sure what those will be. There's probably a select few. PPAs I think there's a PPA coming up, will go it? over there. Yeah. Well, JW will go over, play those PPAs. But as we know, Ben sits in the, the PPAs and that's where he is. And JW's yeah. got to go find him. Yeah. That's the downside of all this nonsense. Yeah. But, uh, well, listen, I mean, you look at, uh, look at what's happening right now in golf, even regardless of how this shakes out, somebody with enough money one day could come in and say, Hey, here's a massive check. I mean, right. we have Sergio Garcia, Dustin Johnson. I mean, they've won recent masters and they just got paid to go over to the, the right. new golf tour. Mickelson's over there too, right? Right. He's there too. Yeah. Um, Speaking of Sergio, I played a little pickleball with him this last weekend. How not was a bad he? player. He's not he a bad. Right? I watched a no. little bit. He looked all right. Yeah, 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 yeah. He I think he golf. Looked... I think there's an easy transition there for, uh, like, the at least in hand. terms of doubles. The, the hand eye for golfers is like, if you've ever go, I don't know if you guys have ever golfed with somebody who's like a top level player. It is <clears throat> effortless. I mean, they're 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 straight up on a different level than other humans. Right. The hand eye coordination they have is is it's like you just you look at them and you go how, and it and it's just like automatic. It, they're just at a different level. And uh, so see if that. I think he played tennis a little bit as a kid too. Like I think he has a a touch. Yeah, of and a, he's still plays. Sergio? Oh, yeah. he does, and okay. he still plays. He said he uh, in pickleball definitely just in that little short rec game I played with him. He's at least as good as I am, I think. Wow. Damn. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying a lot. Travis, have you seen hey, Tyson play? I saw you hitting a few. I mean, you didn't look bad. Oh, look at this guy. <laughs> you hesitated, Travis. I <laughs> All right. <laughs> you Travis, one time. It, hey, I, I, like would, a four I would five. judge you off a few balls. What are you? You're like a four or five? Yeah, maybe. Uh, no, he's I saying know. a four. Not a tournament Tyson, four or five. Tyson convinced me to play four or five with him, and I'm I'm probably more of a five oh. Convinced me to play four or five. I would beat with him. Thomas in singles every single day. Uh, nobody cares about singles. <laughs> it's true. Not many. I, if we had a clone as a partner, I would beat him in doubles. So anyway, Travis, because Tyson doesn't want us. We went and played a four or five tournament together in Vegas and we got smoked. We definitely yeah. did get smoked, but it also was only fifty percent my fault. <laughs> I like, I like they that. target you tyson did you get targeted? no no, no i didn't no i okay. definitely did not get targeted i wasn't bad enough that i got targeted i got targeted i just got targeted i felt it for the first time in my life <laughs> <You're great. laughs> sometimes i like being targeted it's like all right i get to play like, more balls lights lights a little fire it's that underdog mentality it's like i'm gonna come at you 10 times harder it's well like, it certainly like opened it. up some earnings you know like they have to hit it so thomas that yeah. tournament was also a year ago I'm so much better now. Oh, seven, seven months or something like that. Whatever. It's all a blur to me. You're better. What have you been drilling? No, 
just play in rec not. games. I certainly hope not. Play in rec games, dude. I I Although I do have a ball rec machine games actually online. I think I watched one of them. Mm-hmm. Trap or uh, Tyson? An entire yes. rec game? I don't know if I watched the whole thing. Who was I playing? A few points. No clue. Nighttime game. You guys oh. have the camera set up. Yeah, oh, I used two? to do that a lot. Yeah, it might was have been. Me and, oh, I earned him. <laughs> and I also <laughs> won one? the game. Can't and clear, I still never got, I never got my dink stuff that we had. I had come to me. I said, if yeah, you win the game, know. if you win, you get the dink, all this dink paraphernalia. And I was like, cool. And he's like, yeah. if I, you lose, you have to travel with the dink for the rest of the season. So I was not going to lose that thing. You dominated. Yeah, had to. Nice. Good stuff. Look at Thomas has no answer. What would I even say? You'd be like, what's your address, Tyson? I do owe you some dink t-shirts. Yeah. You'll get no, it's in the mail right now. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, I did see there's something coming from DHL. Maybe it's you. Uh okay. I want to ask Travis one more. I want to ask Travis one more question. So um just I, what's like your biggest takeaway from Major League Pickleball generally? Anything maybe you would fix, anything that you were like, this is why it's gonna be so great. Or I mean, do you have was there anything you came away from last weekend and you were like, This is this is the I don't know. Biggest takeaway. Yeah, it's really tough to say because there was a lot of them. But I would say, you know, my my initial response is that the reaction from the fans that I spoke to was so positive that they seemed to be having as much fun as I was playing. Yeah. And you know, you get that like through the tennis world, you get that a lot. Like someone comes up and like, "Hey, great playing! You did a great job!" Blah blah blah. But this was much more uh, like genuine. You could feel that people were immersed in the moment and they were living and dying with each point and i think that the fact that the rec sport is as popular as we both know it is we all know it is that people feel connected to the players and feel connected to the teams if we can build on that and build on momentum which is why we went with florida smash you know that was really my pitch is i don't want a business i want a community that was important to me. And if we can build on that, and a lot of people in our community are asking us, hey, where do we get merch? Where do we get this? Where do we get that? Um, so if we can have these communities rep our teams and care about our teams yeah. and feel the events the way that the fans at the event felt it, then yes, Major League Pickleball will be enormous because there's nothing like it. I wrote Steve at one point, I think it was after the second night, like, how, how do people go back to normal events after this? Like the, the adrenaline's so high. Uh, you know, you form a bond with your teammates, the, the formats just creating all this energy and, and all these these great moments. Uh, so again, there's going to need to be some tweaks, but that energy was not just felt by me. It seemed like it was felt by everybody who was watching. Yeah. Yeah. I heard that multiple times from multiple people. Like, how do we go back to a normal tournament and a normal event after experiencing this? Yeah. Yeah. Not yeah. much like it. Nothing like it. That's like the tagline or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, there isn't. <laughs> uh, no, that's good. All right. Let's let's end on that. That was solid. All right, yeah. gentlemen. Thanks, Thanks Travis. Travis. Thanks so Thanks much, guys. You. See you soon. Britton Meyer. We'll say your last Definitely. name correctly because uh, we heard it said incorrectly one time uh, this weekend. Don't let that happen again. <laughs> it wasn't me. I believe it. <laughs> or right, Thomas. It, okay. See you guys. Later. Have a great day. Later. You too. Later. Bye. Thomas. Yes, we're still recording. I know. Did you catch that when uh, Travis was given the award for, uh, was it a sportsmanship award I think he was given or something oh, at the end? No, I was out in the parking lot. But Oh, yeah. They put an H instead of an M in his last name. Mm, tough. So, really tough. I was like, I don't even know who that is. So, um, okay. We on next week? What? What are you going to say to me? Don't, if we don't have an emergency pod between now and then, because we have an emergency pod update that needs to happen. Hold on. Uh oh. Breaking news. Breaking news. Uh, so there's a couple things I can't, there's a couple things that have, that have happened and are unfolding right now that, we're trying to figure out how to tastefully publish. Okay. That will be the only thing we talk about next episode. 
Um, I two re- different, two separate things that will dominate the topic, the the, the conversation for okay a while. I got Tuesday I, and I got Wednesday open. I let's got Tuesday and Wednesday open. Yeah. Okay. In the mornings. Um, let's see. Can you guys follow us on Twitter? Follow us on Twitter. Yeah, we're, I, we're ramping up Twitter. Pickleball yeah. Twitter. It's it's starting to happen a little bit more. I like and it. I'm very like the action there. So it's cool. Also, we can interact with people more. It's more conversational. I don't like these other platforms where I don't know for whatever reason it just doesn't lend to that. And here on Twitter, we can like go back and forth more of a and it's yeah. it's a faster. You know, Instagram. You gotta make everything look pretty. You know, same with all the other channels. Polished. Twitter, we're just unpolished. Throwing it out there. Yeah. Follow Diamond us. Diamond in the rough. Um, okay. No, good episode. Uh, good episode. Later. See ya.